justice. And th in this supposed democracy is hungry for justice. Uh, and economically, we have an injustice that expresses itself in this somewhat arcane world of interest rates. But it's no less an injustice than a man wrongly accused on a show trial who ends up going to jail for life uh, for a political purpose. That's an injustice we can recognize. Zero percent interest rates are an injustice we cannot recognize, but we should recognize for what it is, a gross misjustice perpetrated by the politicians in cahoots with the bankers, in cahoots with the central bankers, in cahoots with the Bank of International Settlements, which is the central banker of central bankers. Yes, higher interest rates would be painful, but we need to take that medicine to get rid of these parasites. But don't you think the bankers would get rich, richer on the higher interest? The, the, of course, you're going to have um, <laughs> the, the, the market is going, you know, there's always going to be players on the margin gaming the system, working the markets, making money. That's not actually, you know, parasites in a small quantity are not a bad thing. Your gut is full of parasites right now. If you took them out of your gut, you'd be unhealthy. So having a few banker parasites like an Osborne around, it's not necessarily the worst thing. But you don't want the parasites running the entire show. Yes, there'll be some profiteering on the margins, but the system as a whole has to be preserved. You know, you can, you can make the comparison with the economy with the ecology. You know, two words that seem to go together really well. Um, the, the ecology of the financial world is being destroyed with risk that's spilling out of the Exxon Valdez called Goldman Sachs, called Barclays, called uh, uh, Lloyds. They, it's like a tanker up there in, in the Puget Sound, Alaska, spewing tons and gallons and barrels and millions of barrels of toxic risk. Risk that is the byproduct of their of their immoral, unjust activities playing the game on LIBOR and other, er, other areas. It's an environmental catastrophe. Again, it's not hard, if, it's not hard to, to, to rhetorically build a case to go after these guys, but nobody in politics is doing it because they are supported by these guys. That they are the, in America, they almost elected a private equity CEO in Mitt Romney. That, that, that you know, <laughs> What, what insanity is that? You, you know, the biggest growth industry in America is the prison business. What are they talking about here in this country? Privatizing the prisons? That's the last thing you want. You know, because in America they privatized the prisons and they did the Corrections Corps of America. You can look it up. Biggest private prison operator in America. They cut a deal with 48 states. They'll run the prisons if the state guarantees 98% occupancy. <laughs> Okay. Is, let's let's what, take some more. Let's take some more, gentlemen. In the Let me just talk about money being created first. And um, the common perception is that a bank takes a deposit, uh, let's say hundred dollars. They then keep ten dollars in reserve and they lend out ninety dollars. This is the common perception. It's the fractional reserve banking model. This is what people believe is the the case. In, in fact, it's not really the case. The case is that. If, an, if uh, somebody like Guy Hans, who's a private equity guy, goes to a bank on uh, Wall Street or, or the city of London, and he needs a billion dollars to buy something, the bank uh, loans him a billion dollars. It has no collateral value whatsoever. The bank has no reserves against that billion dollars. The bank has no deposits against that billion dollars. They simply make a check, a loan to him of a billion dollars. He then go buys that company, and then that billion dollars is included in the economy as a billion dollars. So it was created by the bank, effectively, out of thin air. Uh, since the deregulation era of the Reagan-Thatcher years, we have this period of what are known as leverage buyouts, made famous in this country by people like Sir Jimmy Goldsmith and uh, around, around the world, where they convince bankers to lend them money against assets that they don't own, but they're going to acquire with the money that they borrow. I was working on Wall Street in the 80s during the period of Michael Milken and the rise of Drexel Burnham Lambert and the leverage buyout. And it created this enormous thing called the uh, stock market bubble, which crashed in 1987, which was the first global shock crash of the modern era, which I was working on Wall Street at the time. I had a front row seat, can tell you all about it. But instead of passing rules and regulations to stop that from happening again, uh, what was done is that they deregulated more so that the banks could take on more debt. The mantra at the time was that it wasn't that the banks were taking irresponsible risk. 
the mantra at the time was that they didn't have enough quantitative analysis of risk for them to manage the risk. We need better mathematics, better quantitative analysis, so that you can take on more risk and do bigger deals. And that trend's been with us for 30, 30 years. It, it, we had the, the, the biggest deals in history getting progressively more each year. In Seoul, and I would posit this, Greece was a leveraged buyout. Uh, John Paulson, hedge fund manager in Wall Street, had a meeting with the leaders of Greece discussing about the crash in Greece before it happened and how to profit on the crash. The same way they profited on the subprime crash, which was another engineered crash, to make money on the downside. And the response is always, to make them easier to borrow more. That's why we have 600 trillion in derivatives. It's all part of this expanding, and that's why bond markets are 250 year highs. That's why the bond market's the biggest bubble in history. It's gonna make the tulip bulb bubble pale by comparison when it busts. And when it busts, ladies and gentlemen, you're gonna have your socks rocked. We're talking about entire countries going belly up. And I believe including this one, because they have way too much debt hardly any gold, and the leadership is out to lunch. But the question of does Britain have resources, and is gold the only resource to have? Yes, of course, Britain has resources. But, uh, you know, I'll give you a little story. Um, you know, Argentina um, is back in the news because uh, the debt deal they did 10 years ago was being questioned by a few holdouts, a few vulture capitalists and hedge funds who wouldn't accept the 30 cents on the dollar they wanted 100 cents on the dollar, so they put that whole deal back into play, and a hedge fund in New York took it upon themselves to find a, a naval ship of the Argentinian uh, armed forces that was docked uh, in, outside of Argentina, and they seized the ship. The hedge fund operator, a private hedge fund, seized a naval ship from a government to satisfy debts that they claimed they were owed. So. Sure, Britain's got assets. Sure they do. Yeah, but are they gonna be able, but, but this is becoming an interesting um, uh, conflict. Uh, to make the long story short, I don't think the assets are, are not gonna cover the debt. But it has assets, but inadequate to cover, to cover the debt. So I, I, would, I would pay up the half a percentage on my mortgage to freeze my mortgage rate, uh, instead of exposing myself to a three to 4% rise suddenly, and then, and then a loss of that house. But isn't that a peculiarly British uh, problem? Our preoccupation with house ownership, as opposed to other countries like France, where the proportion of house ownership is much less, the proportion of rented accommodation much higher. And why should your... I bought my house for £220,000. It's now worth £1.5 million. Why? Is that a better house? It's exactly the same house. Why should it be worth so many more times? Okay, well, let me, well, let me jump in here. So, aren't we, isn't there a concept question here that we need to deal with? Why should wealth be generated merely by sitting in your own house? Um, second of all, the house price due to the falling rate environment, as George Galloway just described, the value of your house increases. And, there, and a lot of people in this country, they use the increase in that value to extract money. They, they borrowed against that increased value. So their, their, their percentage of the mortgage to the equity in the house always, always was high because they kept taking money out as the asset prices went up. When there was a housing correction, then you found that suddenly the mortgage was worth more than the equity in the house. You're underwater. That was the housing crisis, you could say, and it's still going on outside of uh, everywhere in this country except for, for London, which has a very unique appeal to wealthy people. Um, so that, 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 there you see the dynamics of what happens when you have a balance sheet with an asset as prices being fueled by lower interest rates that you then use as collateral to borrow more money. And there you see that loop. It's what the gentleman in back was describing also. There's a positive feedback loop. Where rising values due to higher prices create rising values. That's a bubble. That's a bubble. That's the tulip bulb bubble. That's the South Sea bubble. That's the Mississippi company. You're using the asset to fund more leverage more consumption until you reach a point where you cannot 
grow any more and you have a crash. You saw it in housing. You understand why it happened in housing? Because people took it out against their house. I see people are nodding their head. That you understand. What I'm saying today is that the world banking system has done the exact same thing with sovereign bonds. We're in a massive bubble. We're in a dangerously high bubble, in my opinion. And again, you know, I, I could be wrong, but I this this is what this is what I see, and it looks it looks uh, it looks bad. <laughs> and uh, this year, uh, a group here in the UK is doing another silver coin, and they were at the uh, mint here in the UK, but they've had to change mints. They're now using a different mint, so it's taking longer than they thought. The interest is very high. Uh, again, I just I lend them my my image and my name as a way to um, get silver in people's hands. Now listen, uh, we have to go uh, because the uh, police need to uh, lock up, and it's two minutes before uh, nine o'clock. A lot of TV companies pay Max a lot of money for what he just did for us for free. So the first thing to do is thank Max. Yes, thank you. So I hope you'll stay in touch with us uh, by the various means that are available to us. That's uh, respectparty.org on the internet, uh, or you can follow me at uh, George Galloway MP on Facebook or at George Galloway on Twitter. Thank you all for coming. And if you see anybody that didn't get in, please personally convey my apologies about that. Uh, there aren't many bigger rooms available in Parliament than this that allow filming uh, and photography and the public in. There is, in fact, one other, but it was already booked by someone else. But definitely, if we get a speaker of the eminence of Max Kaiser, we'll book the biggest uh, room uh, that we can. May you all go in peace. Thank you very much indeed. Peacefully, I have no revolution. Oh, yeah.